Stayallday.com. You're now tuned in to the show where you learn the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there boldly and authentically, and the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when the success you've expected to achieve has yet to be achieved. And on top of all this, you get a huge dose of personal initiative, which is the go-getter energy that moves any one of us, including yourself, to go and make things happen instead of waiting for things to happen. And we put all this together into one bundle, one package, one mindset, one method, one philosophy, one book, one show, one daily masterclass, all under one umbrella that is called Work On Your Game. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. And today's topic is uh, piggybacking on what we talked about the last couple of days. And today is we're going to cap this, this little mini series that we've done here. And the topic is how to build your own business ecosystem. Let's get a definition of this word ecosystem. But before I do that, let me tell you that I have a text line where I want you to text me right now or as you're listening to this episode. Tell me what's the best insight that you got from today's episode? What's the question that you have to follow up on anything that I've said here today or a comment that you have on anything I've said? My number is 305-384-6894. Again, 305-384-6894. Again, ecosystem definition, a complex network or interconnected system. Now, I don't like when I use the word system as part of the definition of ecosystem, but we can still say a complex network of interconnected pieces. Let's just call it that. That's the definition that the modified work on your game definition of an ecosystem. But the key word for all of this, two key words, network and interconnected. Those are the two words that I want you to keep in mind as we go through today's episode. I thought of this topic because when I do some, I do a couple clubhouse rooms on the clubhouse app with my friend Patricia Wooster, who is an author, and she focuses on helping people who have a, a life-changing message or some kind of really powerful message. She helps people write their book. So any of you who wants help writing your book, you wanna reach out to Patricia, tell her that you heard about it through me. And on Clubhouse, she and I do a room every, usually every Tuesday. Sometimes we don't do it based on our schedules and things like that, but usually every Tuesday we do a room where we talk about book marketing and book selling. And we've done some rooms also on just building those business ecosystems. And one of the things that she wanted to bring me in to talk about was how you create that ecosystem around what you do. And she and I just found each other on Clubhouse and she saw how you know I had the books that I have and then how I have them bundled up and I make bundles out of the books. And then there's the courses after that and the coaching after that and the podcast to kind of keep everybody in, keep everybody in the loop even when you we are in between books and all of those things. So she asked me about this and we had talked about, we started talking about ecosystems probably months ago, but I just now, just now got sparked in my mind to talk about this as a full episode. So that's why we're talking about it here today. And she was talking specifically, we were talking specifically about just people in the thought leadership world, which are people who write books and then they sell courses and then they do coaching and they have workshops and do consultations and they give speeches and then they're on social media talking about these things, apps like Clubhouse, podcasts, things like what we're doing right now. So today what I want to do is give you a big picture view of building that ecosystem of your own business. Again, keep these two words in mind from the definition, network and interconnected. Those are the two words I want, two key words to remember as we climb into this episode. Point number one, the topic once again, how to build your own business ecosystem. Number one, you must be able to take people from one step to the next. Because an ecosystem is not a one-stop, an ecosystem is not just a one-stop thing. It could kind of be a one-stop shop, but it's not really one stop. Now, it could be a shop that covers a lot of different things, but it's not one stop. There's several stops, but they're all in the same place. That's the great thing about an ecosystem. It's kind of like if any of you has ever gone on vacation and you stayed at a resort. So for example, down here in Miami, we have the Fountain Blue, which is a, it's a hotel, but it's a resort at the same time. In other words, it's the kind of place that if you stay at the Fountain Blue, you could technically, theoretically, you probably wouldn't want to, but theoretically, you could stay inside the Fountain Blues um, property for a whole week, never leave and have everything you need. Uh, you need something to eat, they got that. You need breakfast, lunch, dinner, they have that. You need a gym, you need a pool, you want some nightlife type of entertainment, you want to go to a bar, you want to get some kind of some kind of show, something like that. All of those things, all in one place, you technically would not have to leave the premises. You get everything that you need. That's what a resort does. If any of you ever travel to a place like, I remember I went to the Dominican Republic years ago and they had these all-inclusive resorts. Everything is in there. So you pay one price, all the food comes with it. All the drinks come with it. All the whatever kind of 
performances, if there's a singer or a dancer or some kind of uh, comedian or a musical show or something like that, that all comes with it. All the food is in there, the hotel room comes with, all of that stuff is in one place. You don't have to leave the actual premises. They do have outdoor areas like pools and beaches and things like that, but it's all in one spot. Your business ecosystem is like the business version of the all-inclusive resort. I was just talking to a friend of mine from Philly. He was telling me that he and his family had just went to Disney down in Orlando. And I didn't even ask him where he stayed, but they probably stayed at some type of all-inclusive resort. Because if you're going to do it, you might as well stay at a place like that. And he stayed at a resort like that. All of the things that you need are all in one place. Now, of course, they left the premises to go over to Disney and get on the rides and et cetera, et cetera. But this is the same thing that you're going to do business-wise. So I want you to take that vision because everyone knows what an all-inclusive resort looks like. Even if you've never been to one, you got an idea, go Google it, look it up on the internet or watch a movie where somebody stays at a resort. You see how they are. What, does the, what do those resorts do? They take you from one step to the next. Oh, you need to sleep? All right, we got that here. Here's the hotel room. Oh, you want something to eat? All right, here's where you can get food. We got 20 different restaurants. Oh, you want to have some fun? Here's a place where you can play. You want to hang out on the beach? The beach is over there. You want to lay by the pool? The pool's over there. Oh, you want something to drink at night? All right, here's where the bar is. Oh, you want some more food? Here's some more restaurants. All right, you need to go to sleep again? Here's a place you can sleep. You want to work out? All right, here's, here's the gym over there. So everything is all in one spot. So what you need to do as a business person is see the evolution of your audience and anticipate their needs. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later in this episode. Ecosystems are interconnected. Remember that key word, meaning that you give people not just what they need or want right now, but also what they will need or want next after right now. Because we all know as humans, we grow, we evolve, we change what we needed yesterday, not the same thing that we need today. And what we need right now, Yes, this will serve our needs for now, but eventually we're gonna need the next thing. Your job is to anticipate what is that next thing people are gonna need because they might not even know, or they might not even really be thinking about it. Your job is to think about it and provide it to them before they even realize that they needed it. And there are some companies that do a really great job at this. Let's talk about the company that made the phone you're probably listening to me on right now called Apple. What did Apple do? Apple started out with desktop computers. They eventually, uh, along with you know, Bill Gates and Microsoft, came up with this idea for the laptop. This is a computer you can just sit in your lap. It's like a notebook, but it's a computer. Now, everybody has the laptop, so Steve Jobs came up with this brilliant idea. How about we take all the music that people listen to and allow them to put it in one device that fits in your pocket, the MP3 player. Then they created this demand. They created demand because nobody was asking for this. They created the demand for this device that was everything in one. It was a computer, an MP3 player, and a phone all in one device. Computer, MP3 player, and a phone in one device. Now we call that the iPhone or the smartphone. The other people copy it as a smartphone, and to this day, Apple makes the bulk of, it, the bulk of their money from that smartphone. Then they created a tablet. All right, let's take that notebook idea and let's create just like a one piece of paper, not even a book, but just one piece of paper and then just make it digital. That became the iPad. Then the wireless earbud. You just stick it in your ear. There is no cords and it connects by Bluetooth to your device and you can listen to whatever you listen to. Now they're in our cars. The car play system looks like it came from Apple. Now I don't think, I don't know if it's specifically an Apple program. Any of you has a car that is like, 2020 or 2021 or later, you see these car play systems that they have in the car now. As soon as you connect your phone to the, the uh, what is it called, the aux cord through the car's system, you got this car play system and it looks pretty much like an Apple, looks like an Apple screen, but it's on your phone. I think that's an Apple thing. I don't know, but I think it is. I would have to Google that. Didn't do it before I put in notes for this episode. But this is what Apple did. They created this whole ecosystem to where they're not necessarily thinking about what's the next thing you need like from this year to next year. What they're thinking about is how can we take our tentacles and stretch them from one part of your life to another part and another part and another part. So first was, all right, people use their computers a lot, so let's make them computers. All right, now people using computers, what do pe- a lot of people listen to music. All right, so let's get them a music device. Now let's combine the computer and the music and the internet all in one device. They hit with that. Now, all right, people need something to, to be able to listen to their stuff. So instead of plugging it in, let's give them something that can just fit right into their ears. And next thing, who knows, Google's probably, not Google, but Apple, they'll come up with something that goes in your eyes. Maybe something that gets implanted in your brain. Who knows? I, this sounds crazy right now, but 10 years from now, it might not sound so crazy because we're all going to have whatever that thing is. So the ecosystem is not necessarily today, tomorrow. It's all right, this part of your life, that part of your life, then that part of your life, then that part of your life to where they basically taking over everything and all your devices are 
under their umbrella and that helps them because now with your affinity for their brand now every product that they put out you might as well just get another one because you're already part of their ecosystem this is one of the benefits of getting into or getting people into your ecosystem they keep creating the next thing and the next thing and the next thing that we either need or didn't even know we need it but we want it as soon as we see it and then with every purchase they're further pulling us into their world to where you don't really want to do without them like i have a Mac Book Air computer. I got a iPad tablet. I have Airbud, I mean AirPod earbuds, and I have a Apple phone, iPhone. So I probably would not switch to an Android because if I switch to an Android, then all of these other devices are not going to communicate with the Android as easily as they communicate with the iPhone. So I'm pretty much stuck, quote unquote, stuck with the iPhone for the rest of my life as long as I'm using a smartphone simply because. Apple has roped me into the ecosystem so much so that it would be more hassle to get out of it than it would to just stay in. All right, this is part of their this is part of their hustle, but it's a good hustle. I'm not mad at this hustle. It is very convenient for me, and I enjoy their product. So it's not like I don't like their product. If I didn't like their product enough, I would deal with the discomfort of getting out of it. But I like their product enough that I'm happy that I'm in that ecosystem. So I'm pointing this out because I'm sure I'm not the only person listening to this who has a MacBook, a tablet. Airbuds and an iPhone and you probably got some other Apple devices that you might not even think I probably got some other Apple devices I'm not even thinking about right now, but this is what their specialty is is roping you into that ecosystem and you know, That's what their um, lost my place here, but that's what their whole game is pulling you into that ecosystem another example is any of you ever who has ever flown first class on an airline what do they do they give you two, first of all, when you fly first class, they give you two checked bags for free, even when you're flying domestically. Now, when you fly domestically anything and you're flying any uh, class of the airplane other than first class, you have to pay for every checked bag. Usually, at least it used to be, I don't check bags often when I fly, but when you do, the last time I checked, I think it was $30 or $35, maybe $40, depending on what airline you fly. I fly American a lot because they fly out of Miami and out of and into the city of Miami a lot, and that's where I live. And when you fly first class, you get two checked bags for free. You don't even have to pay for them. Then, when you get on the plane, you get a really comfortable seat that you get to sit in. Then, after they give you the really comfortable seat, then they give you food and drinks before the plane even takes off. Then, they give you personalized service throughout the flight. They come up to you. The last time that I was on a first class flight, they come up to you probably over the course of a flight. I was on a flight, and probably flight was maybe four, five hours. The flight attendant who was manning the whole first class terminal came up to me probably four or five times over the course of the flight and asked me, hey, do you want something to eat? Do you want something to drink? Can I get you anything? Now, when you're sitting in the economy class, they don't come up to you that often. They might come by, they don't even come up to you actually. In first class, they come up to you. In the economy class, they just walk by you. And if you happen to, if you happen to want something that they're offering, cool, but if you don't, then hey, too bad. All right, you're just gonna have to wait until you get off the plane and you can get whatever you want when you are free to move about the country, as they say. So then, when you're flying first class, they give you personalized service throughout the flight. Then, you're the first one who gets to get off the plane. Then, after you've gotten off the plane, they got your email address because you bought the first class flight. Now they're gonna market to you to try to get you to fly first class again because they know that you loved it the last time. Now, how do they know you loved it? Because they give their very best service and I was, I'm assuming, I don't know if I have any flight attendants listening to this episode. If I do, please send me a text because I have questions. But I assume that it's, a, it's like a boon for a flight attendant to be able to work the first class section of a plane. I think it's more fun if I was a flight attendant, just by my observation, my amateur observation, I think it's more fun to work the first class section of a flight than it is to work the economy section. As I've sat in both sections and I've never seen a jerk in the first class section. Doesn't mean they, aren't, they don't exist, but there are way more jerks sitting in the economy than there are sitting in first class. I think it's more fun to work first class and you only got to deal with like, what do you got? Maybe 12 people, eight people, four people, depending on the size of the plane, maybe 20 people. But these are all people who paid high ticket already. And in my experience, any of you salespeople out there who are listening to this, in my experience, people who pay more money usually are the nicest people, believe it or not. And so anyway, the airline's gonna market to you because they want you to fly first class again because they know you loved it the last time. Now notice that when you see those videos on planes and these days because we have social media, 
We see them all the time now, depending on who you're following. These videos of people arguing on planes or people um, fighting with each other on planes, people being testy with the flight attendants on planes or the flight attendants getting testy with customers or passengers on planes. You know, those arguments and those fights and those you know, confrontations, they're always happening in the economy class. You never see those happening in first class. You never see people fighting in first class. Why is this? Because they give their best service to the people sitting up there and the people who spent the most money, all right, they don't have, they don't have the same, they don't have the same aggravations. They don't come, they don't come onto the plane with the same aggravations as somebody sitting in the, the rest of the plane is sitting in. Again, just my amateur observation. If you have a different observation, you will let me know. And the airlines do give their best service to those people. Again, I know that from firsthand experience. So my idea is, here's an idea that I just want to float out there. Maybe some airline can try this or any of you who's thinking about starting your own airline, try this. How about you take the, the concept of what you give for your first class passengers and just do that for the whole plane. Just make the whole plane just like that and then compete on value since your prices will probably have to be higher than other airlines because you're gonna have fewer seats because you need more space and you're gonna be given much more uh, service then you just gotta compete on value. That people are willing to pay more simply because you offer Better, more and better service, more and better hospitality than all the other airlines do. The same way that a company like Louis Vuitton or Louis Vuitton or Gucci or Fendi charges a lot more money for their clothing than Target does, but they're still able to make money. They're still able to make money and compete with Target because they're not competing on price, they're competing on value. So why don't any airlines do that? Or maybe they do. Maybe this is like the, the private plane companies, they're doing it. But I think someone who does it more commercial and more targeted towards the mass market, I think there's a lot of money to be made there. But again, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert on the aviation industry. So if someone tells me that that's not possible to do, which I highly doubt, but if someone knows more about it, you can text me and let me know. Again, the number 305-384-6894. I'm not sure it's feasible, but you let me know. Somebody should try it. Another example, speakers, for example, people who do professional speaking, what I mean here, not music speakers, but speakers who go and give speeches on stages, usually, a person who gives a speech on the stage almost always has written a book. Now, what about after the speech is over? Because your speech is only 60 minutes or two hours. When your speech is done, people are going to forget most of what you said. So can you offer them something else in addition to the speech for further enrichment that further solidifies the message that you just gave? That could be something like you can offer something else like, hey, here's a course that you can get. Here's a webinar you can take. Here's a workshop that I'll teach. Here's a yearly program that I have as a follow up to the speech. That is part of an ecosystem. So an ecosystem, folks understand, doesn't have to be 20 different products. An ecosystem can be two things. An ecosystem can be, all right, you get this, then you get this. All right, we do, I'm going to do this first, and then you're going to get this. You get this for one hour, then I'm going to give you this for the next year. All right, that can be an ecosystem as well. So a system is just, again, interconnected and a network. As long as there's an interconnection and a network, you have an ecosystem. It doesn't have to be 30 things. Point number two, today's topic, once again, is how to build your own business ecosystem. Point number two, there must be seamless communication between elements. What do I mean by that? When I say seamless communication, that means one message must connect to the next message. That's it. Your messages must connect. There must be some synergy between what you did the first part and what people get in the second part, the third part, and the 37th part. If you're going to have more parts, they must all connect to each other somehow, some way. I'll give you an example. Google. Do they have seamless communication between your elements? I would say so. They started out with a web search. When you go to google.com, you can search anything and they'll tell you where, wherever you can find it. Then they created an email system. Then they got, G, they got Gmail. Most of you have Gmail accounts. Then they have cloud storage now. They have G, Google Drive. Then they have the G Suite. Then they started giving you the Google Calendar. Then Google Documents, Google Docs. Now they have a phone as well. I don't think their phone's gonna come close to compete with the iPhone, at least not in the foreseeable future, but they tried it with the phone. The point is this. All the pieces of Google's ecosystem work together. So I like Apple for their physical devices, the actual tangible items I can hold in my hand. I like Google for the, the cloud devices, for the digital stuff. So when it comes to my email, my calendar, my cloud storage, documents, spreadsheets, I like using Google stuff. Apple stuff does not compare with Google stuff, as in my opinion. Now again, you may have a different opinion, but that's just the way that I see it. So. They both are doing a great job of creating ecosystems in what they do. And they're both head-to-head -head competitors too, which I think helps us because they actually help 
keep each other's swords sharp. They both keep innovating and trying to make better stuff so they can compete with the other guy. The point is, all their pieces work together and it's easier to just use all of their stuff together than it is to have pieces that are incompatible. The hard work is making them all work together. And Google has smart people on their team who make that happen. They have smart people who do that hard work of making everything work together so they don't have to figure it, so the consumer doesn't have to figure it out. Authors do this, specifically people who write fiction. I don't know if we have any fiction authors who listen to this show, but fiction authors, what do they do? Any of you who reads fiction or you have kids who read fiction, you know what they do. They write their books in series format. So it'll be, they put out a book and they say, okay, this is part one of the series and then part two is gonna come out in three months. Then part three is gonna come out next year. Then part four is gonna come out after that. So what does the reader do? As long as they like part one, they're gonna buy part two, three, and four. So by writing one book is really good, a fiction author is actually selling you four books. And I don't know what fiction authors do as far as a further ecosystem, but I'm sure there are some fiction authors out there who have other elements besides just books that they continue to sell on top of the books. Many nonfiction authors, people like myself, we write one book on a certain topic, maybe we write others, but the books are not necessarily connected all the time. So somebody can get one of our books and never get another book. But the way we can borrow from fiction authors is to take our books and create bundles, create packages, create ecosystems with our books. For example, I will get you a free copy of my book, The Mirror of Motivation, The Self-Guide and Self-Discipline. But I tell you, that's just a discipline book. How about you get the mental toughness one called The Mental Handbook, the confidence one called The Super You, and the personal initiative one called 100 Game Mental Practices, Best Mental Practices, and we put those all together. We call that the Bulletproof Bundle. So now I'm creating an ecosystem with just those four books. So you can create ecosystems in many different ways. The only limit that you have is your imagination. So even though I don't read fiction, but I shared that idea of what fiction authors do for you to understand that you don't need to be some billion dollar company like Google or Apple to build an ecosystem. You can build an ecosystem from your laptop with just a little bit of ingenuity and imagination. Point number three, today's topic once again is how to build your own business ecosystem. Evolve with your audience. This is something that authors do also. Fiction authors, are, you may be talking to a young adult audience at this point, but that young adult audience eventually gets a little bit older and that author may evolve and write about more adult topics because their audience is growing and the author wants to grow with them. I'll give you another example from the music industry, a guy by the name of 50 Cent. We all know who 50 Cent is. He came out as a hardcore gangster rapper and he said in his latest book, just as an example, people becoming authors. 50 talked about how in 2003, when he put out his first album, that his hit record was called In The Club. Everybody was in the club, partying and dancing, his audience at that time. But what he realized over 10 years later was that most of his audience from back then was no longer going to the clubs. They weren't going to the clubs on Friday and Saturday nights. These people now had kids, they had families, and on Saturday, Friday and Saturday nights, what were they doing? They were staying at home watching TV. They weren't going out to nightclubs and bars and, and getting drunk and dancing and partying. So 50 said, you know what? I gotta evolve on my audience. So instead of me making more songs about being in a club, what I'm gonna do is make a TV show that can go with this audience evolution. So 50 went and made a TV show. I don't watch TV, so I have not seen 50's TV show. But from what I see online, it seems like his show is very popular with a similar audience the same people who were listening to his music in 2003 are the same people who are sitting down and watching his TV show in 2021. Now, I personally didn't evolve into watching TV with 50, but I still like 50's music from back in the day. I'm still a fan of his work. And good thing is, 50, understanding the ecosystem, look what 50 did. He wrote a book as well. Now, I don't watch TV at all. I don't even own a TV, so I've never seen his show, but I do read books. So when he put that book out, I got the book the day that it came out. So 50 understood that not everybody's gonna watch the TV show, but some people will read books. So he was able to keep me roped into what he has going on by writing that book, even though the TV show is way more popular than his books. But nowadays, as I said, Jay-Z, another example. When Jay-Z first came out as a rapper in his early years as rapping, Jay-Z was rapping about going to the clubs, rapping about being single and making songs like Big Pimpin'. And now what does he rap about? Now he's married, now he has kids. What does he rap about? He raps about family, he raps about collecting art, he raps about building generational wealth, he raps about his legacy, because those are the things that he's into now. He's over 50 years old, so he's not rapping about being in clubs and getting girls, because that's not the life that he's living anymore. And the people who were listening to him in 1998, 
those people have evolved the same way that he's evolved. That was over 20 years ago. So he couldn't be talking about the same things unless he just he just failed to evolve and failed to grow as a person, which would be a failure on his part. And he probably wouldn't be able to keep up with that audience. And if you're 50 years old rapping about being in a club, then the 18 year olds who are listening to you are like, wait a minute, I don't want to hear about no 50 year old guy rapping about being in a club. I don't want to see you in a club. They want to see people their age in it. So Jay-Z moved on and evolved into a different topic. This is part of building an ecosystem as well, is that you have to evolve with your audience. I'll give you another example. Dre Baldwin. I used to talk about all basketball. When I first came out, first five years-ish that I was out, all I was talking about was playing basketball, getting better at basketball, working on your game in basketball. Then people were asking me about mindset. And through the mindset, I actually built the bridge between the athletes and the non-athletes. People who weren't athletes started finding me because I started talking about mindset and it wasn't just for athletes. Then people were asking me about business because I was doing business things. So I started talking about those things because that's what I was doing and my audience grew with me. Many of you, again, I've said this many times, many of you weren't watching me when I, or listening to me when I was talking all basketball because you are not a basketball player. But some of you used to play ball, you don't play ball anymore, but you still follow me because I, my topic has evolved and is, has grown the same way that you have grown. You were in business then, trying to go to the NBA, and you understood the mindset stuff could work for anything, and now you're in the professional world as a business person, so when I talk about these business topics and the mindset stuff that can still apply to that, it still applies to you. So the evolution, you have to grow with your audience, but you gotta know who your audience is. Amazon, for example, when they came out, you know, Jeff Bezos had the vision that they wanted to be the everything store, but at first they weren't that. They were focusing on books. Then they slowly expanded into more stuff. Then they created something like Prime, which hooked all of us in, made it sticky. So now you're going to buy everything from them that you buy online because you can save that money. Now they have music. They got Amazon Music, Amazon TV, Amazon Music, Amazon Podcast. If you, they want to be that one-stop shop in the everything store. Now they're competing with the Googles. They're competing with the Apples. They're competing with whoever else is popping up, but they're working on it. And again, all these companies kind of keep each other's swords sharpened because they're all competing against each other and they all got really smart people on their side. So this is part of the evolution as well, is a part of the ecosystem as well, rather, is evolving with your audience. How is your audience changing? What are they looking for now that they weren't looking for back in the day? And how can we make sure we are offering it or I am offering it if it's just you by yourself? These are things you need to be thinking about 10 steps ahead of your audience. Not at the same time, because that's too late. Early is on time, when time is late, late is forgotten. So you gotta make sure you're ahead of your audience and thinking about how are they growing and evolving? How can I offer them what they're gonna need tomorrow? Let's recap today's class, which is how to build your own business ecosystem. Definition is a complex network or interconnected pieces, we'll just say. We won't use the word system in the definition of ecosystem. Let's point number one. Be able to take people from one step to the next. See the evolution of your audience and anticipate their needs, which we'll talk about later. Ecosystems are interconnected. Give people not just what they need or want now, but what they will need or want next. And it doesn't necessarily have to be on a time frame. This can just be looking at their life. Like Apple gave you a laptop, then an MP3 player, then a phone, then a tablet, and now wireless earbuds, and who knows what's coming next. That's not necessarily about your growth in time. It's just about what you're doing in your life. Point number two. Hold on, back on that. We're still on, back up on that. We're still on point number one, recap. Now Apple's in a car play system. They keep creating the next thing and the next thing that we either need or don't even know that we need until they show it to us. Airlines, if you fly first class, they give you two check bags and they give you a comfortable seat, they give you food and drinks, then personalized service throughout the flight, then you can get off the plane first, your bags come off first, then they market you to fly first class again. What they're doing is trying to rope you into their ecosystem by giving you their best possible service. They give their best to those people. Point number two, seamless communication between elements. Google, for example, started with web search, then email, then cloud stores, then calendar, then documents, and then a phone. At least they try it with the phone. The point is all their pieces work together and it's easier to just use their stuff than it is to have in incompatible pieces. Fiction authors do this really well. They write their books in series. So when you buy one book, what you're really doing is buying four books because then book number two, three, and four, they're going to build anticipation for it and then sell you those as well. Fiction off, non-fiction authors rather, could learn from this, something that I did with taking a book on mindset and then making three more books on mindset, putting them together and calling it a bundle and selling you the whole bundle instead of just selling you one book. So you can learn something from people who are in similar industries to you, but doing things a little bit differently. Point number three, evolve with your audience, 50 Cent. 
Great example of this. He used to make music about being in the club, but he realized 20 years later, most of his audience was not in the club anymore. They had families, they had kids. They're staying at home on Friday and Saturday nights. So 50 said, let me make a TV show because that's what they're doing, watching TV. Jay-Z, same thing. Used to rap about getting girls and going to the club, but he doesn't do that anymore. Now he raps about legacy. He raps about art collection. He raps about family because that's where his life is now and his audience is the same way. Me, I used to talk about basketball, and then it grew the mindset that built the bridge into business. My audience has grown with me. Amazon used to sell books, they expanded into more stuff, they added Prime. Now they want to become that everything store and they're still working on it. But this is the evolution of your audience. Know where they're going, see it before they get there, and you be there before they arrive. And that's how you keep your ecosystem flowing and growing. Send me a text. Tell me the best thing you got from today's masterclass. My number 305-384-6894. Again, 305-384-6894. Work on your game. Dre, all day.